We are going to have a chance to have a nice, small, intimate conversation today. And so we should probably get underway. Uh, if you haven't done so already and would like to get some coffee or water or soda, please do so and then join our group. What we'll do is um, first have a introduction for Baruch Ahmed and after that, in that introduction, I will say something um, framing Bangladesh, I guess, a couple of words about that and about GW's connection with BRAC over many years, um, and then um, I'll complete my introduction. Then we will hear remarks from Farouk Bai, who will uh, then, um, after his maybe half hour or so of remarks, we'll see, uh, give a brief five-minute video about BRAC. Um, and then after that, we're just going to have an uh, informal conversation. I think we'll take these chairs and uh, open it up and hopefully have a lively and, and interesting um, general discussion. But in the uh, first instance, let me just say it, it is both a great pleasure and really a high honor to introduce Farouk Ahmed, who is the executive director of BRAC International, which I think of as one of the three leading positions in, in BRAC. Um, and so by way of uh, doing so, I would just like to say one or two words for people who might not be familiar with it, with what a special organization BRAC is from our point of view, being interested in successful economic and human development around the world and about our connections with BRAC here at GW. So I'm sure you may hear, I think that there's a sign there saying that BRAC's the number one NGO in the, in the world and that's kind of a regular uh, ranking. And then I think there were a couple of years somewhere where BRAC was ranked number two. I don't know what was wrong with them, <laughs> you know, what, how, how, they made that, how they made that error. Um, but it was founded, BRAC was in a developing country, Bangladesh, and is still based there from that point of view, gets to be the world's number one um, NGO. And despite the fame that we think they deserve, somehow BRAC continues to be the best kept um, excellent secret in, in development. And so this event is another attempt um, on many of our parts to change that, uh, long deserved. So Bangladesh does have some very big challenges. Uh, it has a population more than half the size of the US now. I think it's just over 165 million, right? So it's a slightly more than half the size of the US in, a, in an area um, no bigger than Wisconsin. Um, and another secret, though, is the seemingly miraculous transformation for Bangladesh since its independence in 1971 which I'm old enough to remember. I was in school, and it was a dramatic event, Bangladesh becoming independent from Pakistan. Um, and at the time, the Secretary of State called Bangladesh the world's international basket case. It was I, one of his staff, not him. Uh, we, we checked that, and apparently there is some, okay, well, either, either he, who will not be named, or his staff, because I don't want to misquote anyone, right? Um, and so other people a little more charitably called it the international test case, right? So that's the second case term in the sense that they thought conditions were so bad in Bangladesh that if you could succeed in economic and human development there, you could do it anywhere. So it's the special test case for, for international um, agencies. But since that time, Bangladesh's transformation is so dramatic so truly dramatic that I like to call it the case in point for economic development. Um, so we have a lot of cases there. But a major reason for this transformation is, of course, BRAC. Um, NGOs and their unique, effective role in development in, in um, Bangladesh is, is uh, fairly well understood. The central leading role of BRAC in all of this really needs to be um, underlined. Uh, you know, another of the couple of you know, the really five, I guess, reasons for Bangladesh's transformation is what they've done in the areas of human capital, namely health, nutrition, and education. And there, once again, BRAC has played a, a leading role in, in making that um, in making that um, happen. And uh, Farouk Bai's role 
and, and leadership in that over many years is, is, is well known. Um, and so it's also worth mentioning, I'd like to maybe toot our own GW Horn here, that, uh, that we at GW had a, an active five-year partnership with Brack University shortly after it was founded that included uh, a number of us, eight professors here, um, and I think that may have been one, in fact, yeah. And maybe Jennifer was one too, and I was one. So eight professors from GW went to Brack University, gave lectures, worked with, you know, talked with faculty about teaching, talked with them about research, and in turn, um, eight or ten, I think, um, professors and administrators from Brack University came here to GW. Um, for example, the, the registrar came for a month and, and shadowed our registrar in order to figure out how to make things run efficiently. I have some students in the room, they may not agree, but at Brack University, there were very long lines going around three sides of a city block, and now it's a, a paragon of, um, of efficiency. In any case, um, many GW professors have worked and done research on, on Bangladesh, um, and, um, and Ted and Colette being two well-known um, examples here, um, and we're delighted to have them uh, with us. Um, PhD students such as Dr. Yao Pen, now an assistant professor, is um, one who's worked in the case of, of uh, Uganda, as is Virginia Robano, and, and worked on Bangladesh, and Vita Bovich has worked on, on Uganda. So all that work in Uganda is part of BRAC International, um, of which uh, Farouk Ahmed is the executive director. Um, and so uh, I want to say that he has a very long and distinguished career. It includes 10 years as director of BRAC's famous health program, um, bringing its very renowned already health and nutrition interventions to, to national scale. And, and, and um, very impressively, he holds two master's degrees uh, representing what I think is a very fine synergy of masters in education and in public health, I, I think. Uh, th that it is health sciences, perhaps. Um, an excellent combination, in my opinion. It's a BRAC type of synergy. And before joining BRAC, he also had positions with the government of Bangladesh, as I recall, and with the World Bank. And so, uh, with that uh, little longer than planned introduction, uh, I would like to say, Farouk Ahmed, welcome to the George Washington University. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Smith, uh, for this illustrious introduction. I don't know how much I deserve on that uh, uh, personally, but I think, yes, definitely my organization deserves it. Uh, as you said, we have been very uh, secretive organization in terms of our uh, uh, visibility or our, our branding name. That is still a challenge. But uh, let me thank you all for coming this afternoon, and I have to introduce two of my colleagues with me who are uh, joining me from BRAC USA, which is office is based in, in the New York, is Dr. Sharad. Uh, he is our senior vice president for uh, the BRAC US, USA, and Ashley, she is also director here in BRAC USA office, looking after the, our relationship and board matters in BRAC USA office. And I can see a lot of friends here. Um, definitely, uh, some of the friends that I have, been, I know, know them for long ye years. That uh, since I was working in Bragg, or even before, even fa as a family-wise, Colette is here, who worked with my my wife had the privilege of working with Colette also, from Save the Children Point. So there's a lot of familiarity here, in terms of known faces. And thanks again, Professor Stephen Smith, for inviting us uh, to speak this afternoon to this gathering. And I would like to intend to speak for about half an hour. But cut me short if you sing and interrupt me. Feel free to interrupt me if you want to ask questions. And uh, I will speak about uh, Bragg's international journey, why you went international, and what does it mean going international for Bragg as, as an organization. And uh, as Professor Stephen Smith has already mentioned about Bragg's uh, journey in Bangladesh, Bragg's life in Bangladesh almost the same life of Bangladesh itself were born out of the two of the tragedies. One is the 1970 cyclone which washed out half a million people and in one night. And when our founder was a CEO of a Shell oil company and he thought that this suited Buddha life doesn't mean anything. When you one night you leave 
you will <coughs> have a million people washed out. And then the war came, which you mentioned about the uh, our independence war for, with Pakistan, which we lost three million people in that war, and two million women lost their chastity. So it's short-lived, but a high-priced war of independence that we had. And there, from that, I think is the what. And I was an undergrad student at that time, and I went to India to take the training and for 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 my country. And I think this is where we started the the. The strength comes from that war of independence, gave us the identity that we are independent nation. And from there, being the second poorest country at that time uh, in the whole world, and has in 40 years plus, we are aspiring to be a sec middle income country. This journey is, uh, is uh, fabulous in terms of, uh, of experience and as a development test case. Uh, many of the uh, Academics, researchers, uh, very clearly said that a couple of reasons, and one of the major, major reasons they identified that the the government, I give a lot of credit to Bangladesh government, each successive government in Bangladesh gave space to <coughs> civil society organizations. So as I see, for a development in a given society or country, the state has a role to play, citizens and business. For us, the fragile government, the country has, at that time, no human resource, no financial resource, no physical resources. So service delivery was very challenging at that time. Despite the challenge, the plethora of NGOs came and different interventions were tried and piloted, tweaked, inter reviewed time and again, and then we uh, scaled up. And from a high fertility, high mortality country in the 70s, we have become a, a world's uh, surprise in the sense of this country has now brought down the fertility from seven to two in one generation. So those learnings were enormous learning and BRAC played a, a key role in e reducing poverty and empowering poor, particularly women and children. That was our focused area. So with that learning of four, three and a half decades, Friends, partners who are asking why BRAC shouldn't go out its boundary and try whether these learnings can be applied to other social cultural settings. And that, that opportunity came in 19, 2002 after the fall of Taliban government in Afghanistan. And then the Karzai government and other world leaders were requesting BRAC to see whether that we can prove the concept that these learnings can be applied in other cultural environment. So we went to Afghanistan in 2002. And since then, uh, we think that our challenge was to find the right human resource, take the learnings, tweak it, contextualize it, apply it, women-centric development activities. And we applied those in, in, in Afghanistan in a very difficult environment. By the time we learned, and people have also appreciated, that what is BRAC's main strength is, Rex main strength is that we know how to deliver services, critical services, in a resource-constrained environment, in fragile environment, particularly the, for the poor and needy ones, in a less expensive, with high impact. That's what our learning is. Be it education, which we provided the non-formal education for the more focusing on the girl's child, healthcare, community healthcare. We started with the community health work being all, all based on the Almata principles, and we scaled up the healthcare program throughout the country in Bangladesh, and we have taken this in model to other countries and contextualized it. We also taken financial inclusion, which is microfinance, and then we took our agricultural food security programs, the learnings from there, and adolescence and youth programs, which is focusing more on the uh, developing the youth in terms of their skills and livelihoods and life skills. When we moved to the, uh, from country to country, they, so we moved from in Asia, now we are in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Myanmar, Philippines, and Nepal. Nepal is our newest country. So there's the five countries in, in Asia. In Africa, we went in uh, East Africa, Uganda, Tanzania, and South Sudan. West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone. So how do we select those countries? These countries were selected, sometimes opportunistic, 
sometimes strategic. An example would be strategic would be when we went to Philippines. Why we went to Philippines? The Philippines we went because our education program is very effective. And uh, this has been taken by many organizations, both within the country and outside the countries. So the Philippine government was having problem in delivering education for the children who never went to schools or dropped out, or there's no school for the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao. There's a conflict region. And one of the donor was who was working with us for a long time, the Australian government, which is called DFAT now. So, they, so it's a single intervention we took to that region, delivered it. Uh, very successfully, a lot of learnings, a lot of research has done into it by the University of Philippines, also Melbourne University, and BRAC has delivered that through in partnership. So that's a single intervention. I was in Philippines two uh, month back, and we have signed an MOU with the central government, Ministry of Education, because Ministry of Education wants to adapt, now uh, apply this model to other regions with help of BRAC. So that's the strategy. In terms of going to East Africa in a con number of countries in a cluster so that we could re reach the programs in, in, in a contiguous way and draw on the resources that from each country that help the neighboring countries. What we have learned in the last 10-15 uh, years that we have gone international? A lot of excitement in terms of the way we deliver the services. So we our approach is to take a model, tweak it, implement it, build partnership with the local governments at community level and at the district level and national level, work partnership with the government also, and build strategic partnership with other donors or, or, or other NGOs. The ecosystem that we build in delivering services, that's our uniqueness, that we build an ecosystem at the community level, we draw resources from the communities, either the community health worker or the teacher, non-formal teachers, all come from the community. We train them, equip them, and so that they can deliver as per the guidelines set by the government of that particular country. It's very clear on that. So we follow the law of the land and, and go by the rules of the country and, and deliver it. We measure our impact. We also believe in measuring our, uh, our interventions so that our, we are effective in, in terms of delivering the services. We have a big research outfit is in, a, is in, is in Kampala for BRAC International. BRAC from day one believed in evidence and research, so we have a huge research department in BRAC Bangladesh. So we followed the similar model, but we have also small units in different countries which is doing research in partnership with different universities uh, of both within the country and from outside the countries, as I gave an example of Philippines. Similar examples are or, or in other countries too. So the, uh, the challenges we faced in the initial time was the challenge of, I was talking today with uh, my colleague Sharad that how the international organization starts uh, INGOs with, with uh, due respect to those INGOs who are exist in existence when BRAC started, but, but BRAC never followed the models or even the strategy of those INGOs. BRAC wanted to learn from the people where it's serving and develop the uh, interventions based on those people's need. So very organic development of the organization from a very small village in the Northeast to now the largest NGO in terms of its size and effectiveness and innovations. So it's always going back to the people and understanding what people's need is and then really empower people so that people can change their own life. And we, pr we provide the supporting services in the environment. So first challenge we faced is the, how do you build the capacity of the local staff? That's a challenge that we faced. We didn't hire, also the retention of uh, talents is a challenge before us because our, our composition package is also not very attractive in the sense compared to the other NGOs that we want in the market outside Bangladesh. So that's a challenge for us. Uh, we had this limited mobility challenge in, in the countries of conflict, like South Sudan or in Afghanistan, and we paid the price of that in many occasions, in many cases lost life, uh, including uh, abduction. The other challenge we face also a branding challenge. Branding challenge we face, uh, when you go to a country, what, what we are, people very still don't understand Bright's work. The people who understand and get engaged, oh, they find out, when I was in the health department, we were doing so many work, but little known outside, other than the researchers and academics who were involved with us. 
But then the people find, oh, you do this one? We didn't know that you do this one. You do the tuberculosis, you do the malaria work, you also do the maternal child health, you do the nutrition. So these things were uh, less known and confuses people. In Dhaka city, where the BRAC is based in capital in Bangladesh, people would say Narwan, BRAC is a university, or BRAC is a bank. In rural areas, BRAC will be defined as a non-government organization helping poor people to live out of the poverty. In Uganda, our footprint in 10 years, we are the largest NGO in Uganda, with 156 offices, branches in Uganda. And why that has happened? The other NGOs or NGOs or local organizations are still there for ages. So the question is that where we believe that we should be in the scale, when not thin on the ground, but thick on the ground, so that we can reach every corner of the country with the services. And then in Uganda, people will say, oh, it's a microfinance organization. Or is it a uh, education organization? Because we also provide education support to the secondary school poor students. Or it's a health organization. So we are fa facing that challenge. And we have to fix that up. We are now engaging with an organization called Global Organization to work with us to develop a global communication strategy. We are also working on a, on a branding strategy of our uh, flexi program that we call Ultra Poor Graduation. We also learned after three decades of work that the country of microfinance, the birthplace of microfinance is Bangladesh, and I call the country of Bangladesh also the University of NGOs. But then the, the bottom eight to 10% of the poorest group never could enter the microfinance group. So they couldn't access microfinance. So that's why we're learning that we were leaving the poorest of the poor out of the development interventions. So we designed a new program from our learning with our academics, friends and researchers like Professor Stephen Smith and others around the world. And we had been very lucky to attract the talents from all over the world. Uh, the best universities of the world have been always coming forward to help us. We designed a new model, applied it, and we found that we could really graduate these poorest of the poor. And we call it now, we used to call them the targeting the ultra poor TUP. Now we call the ultra poor graduation program and has graduated 1.7 million families in Bangladesh out of poverty. It's also another social safety net, but then you don't have to pay them every year. They are out of the poverty step even after six years of graduation. And that was measured and published by London School of Economics by Professor Robin Burgess. And this model was also taken by other countries and which was published by Ovijit Banerjee and group from the JPL uh, two years back that also came out that that's very successful interview. So the question is what that we are bringing this that one approach is also we do implementation, we want to build partnership, but we also would like to do robust research. What's working, why is it working? What's not working? And if it doesn't work, why it doesn't work? And there are a lot of failures also for, on, our, on our side. So we learn from that and we also bring this knowledge organization and bring this knowledge for policy advocacy. Create more robust evidence and do the policy advocacy like SDG1. So it's a lifetime opportunity for us as a, as a citizen of the world to eradicate extreme poverty. And why not when we have the tools in our hands? Why not the, we all together now, or more than uh, 40 countries are applying this model in different, uh, through different organizations, both government, non-government, BRAC is giving technical assistance. So that's the success and excitement comes to us. But the challenge we face also when we go to international that we have uh, funding challenges. How do you fund your programs? Uh, in Bangladesh, we have been able to generate revenue through our social enterprise models. Roughly around 70-80% of resources are being internally mobilized now. Can we do the same in Black International? That question remains to be answered. Uh, so we are basically, the intervention we, 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 we deliver in the countries I mentioned is the financial inclusion with microfinance and ultra-poor graduation, education programs, particularly primary and, and uh, pre-primary, addressing programs, agriculture, food security, health, nutrition, water sanitation, and emergency response preparedness. These are the things we do. I mentioned about the, uh, about the challenges that we face, but also our challenge is also managing expectation from both sides. Today, we are in 10 countries, and our board in June approved the 11th country going is Rwanda. So Rwanda will be going, we have started applying for registration, so we'll be expanding to Rwanda. 
But then the challenge comes, how do you manage expectation? I was in Pakistan, and when I was meeting the Pakistan Poverty Illusion Fund CEO, which is basically a World Bank Finance Program, and they are our major donor for our intervention in Pakistan. And the chairman of the uh, PPA, Pakistan Poverty Illusion Fund, said that when we expected Brack to come here, two things he expected. One, he thinks Brack will be in the most difficult areas of Pakistan, like Balochistan or Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, go to the interiors. The reason is that most Pakistani NGOs, I have no idea, it's from the quote unquote from the chairman, the then chairman of the PPF, in about 40 people together, and I had my two directors with me, uh, microfinance director and finance director with me, said, most NGOs are on the roadside, on the highways. They're not deep in the villages, so Brad should go deeper as you have gone in other countries. Second, that most NGOs are not in the culture of being uh, frugal. So you know how to be frugal and be more effective. So these are the two things they expected. So how do you manage that expectation in terms of uh, of expanding, but also remain frugal and develop the human resource that's needed to do that? So my point is always I think deep in the night, how do you transfer the brightness of BRAC? If I say, that's the DNA. How do you transfer the brightness of BRAC? Uh, the the our founder is lucky. And I, I think uh, lucky in the sense that he had the first generation of leaders with him uh, who stayed and never left BRAC. The, the, some of them are my classmates from college. They never left BRAC. 40 years stayed in BRAC. Some of them are still in BRAC. So that generation and the leader created, co-created the organization in different directions with failures, with successes, and the, the huge sense of ownership in terms of job plus. So it's, it's not only a, a paycheck, but also plus. I asked my colleagues in South Sudan, in, not in Zuba, but in, in Rumbek, uh, in, the, in the Lake State. I said, why do you work for BRAC? How do you explain BRAC to your family, to your loved ones? Tell me. So my colleagues are mostly mostly female field workers. Two things they said: that we get paid on time. I said, don't the other organizations pay? They said, no. Our family members are working in different organizations. So BRAC has this clear policy to be paid before the end of the month. Doesn't matter where you are working. It's in Bangladesh, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Everybody should be paid on the day before the end of the month. Second, she said and I'm still having her face in, in front of me, she said, Brack wants to open a school, non-formal school in South Sudan, 20 kilometers away from the main road, and main road is a mud road, not a, not a paka road. We'll go do that. Many organizations stay on the main road side. So these are the things that I learned from my colleague, that that's what they expect, that what you say, you if you say that, do it and show that. So that's what, how do you manage that expectation? And what, in terms of managing expectation from colleagues, as well as from the funders and the governments, that would mean huge resource uh, mobilization from both financial and human resource. We've been lucky to mobilize that human resource so far in BRAC and BRAC International, but that will be a continuing to challenge in terms of uh, a future. Some countries we are facing also visa restrictions. Coming from a southern country, that's a huge problem. And I was struggling with my colleagues to go to the board in June. Five countries we evaluated. We did desk boarding, desk assessment. Then two countries we zeroed down and sent team to do the physical verifications in terms of our criteria to go to the board. And none of us got the visa for Malawi because we wanted to zero down Malawi and Rwanda. My personal preference was for Malawi. Malawi. So Malawi didn't give us the visa. The problem is that if you're coming from a southern country and go global, what does it mean for us? What kind of challenge you face? And how do you overcome those barriers? I mentioned about the retention, scale versus quality. Sometimes we go for scaling and then we suffer on the, on the quality issues. Uh, and we always said that scale is important, quality is non-negotiable. Scale is important, but not at the cost of quality. So we have to maintain the quality. So that remains the challenge. So we want to say that we are coming from South, birthplace Bangladesh. 
in Bangladesh government policy that we cannot be international from being Bangladesh. So now we had to do a separate board for BRAC and BRAC International. So BRAC as an international organization is registered in the Netherlands. That's why we are registered legally. Because why? A simple reason is that if we take funding from say US uh, government or any foundations from here, which we get money from our BRAC US office, if we take the money inside the country, we cannot take the money out because of the foreign exchange regulations. So these are the challenges when you work from a developing country, from a southern country, you want to go international. So we have gone international outside the boundary of Bangladesh, but we have not been global as yet. And what it means international and global? We have to build the organizational capacity in terms of its all institutional development. What we did in Bangladesh, we haven't done that. We have two offices in resource mobilization. Is one is in New York, one is in London. But we feel that we are very thinly resourced. And if we compare the, the, some of the organizations I've been visiting with my friends to yesterday and today, the organizations who are here, amazing. We are not comparable even at all in terms of the investments they make in resource mobilization. We think our own program managers will be writing the proposals, will be going to the donors. So each of them are 200% busy, and they are the greatest implementers, but they don't have the skills of how to write the right languages, what the USAID would ask for the similar proposals. But some of the donors who worked with us remained with us for decades, like UK and Australia. They have a strategic partnership with Brad. So that's the dilemma we have. And we have not invested, and we want to going forward is one of the, uh, perhaps an issue would be for us as the leadership to invest in uh, resource mobilization agent arena. How do you build relationship with the donors and stakeholders in terms of building relation and retaining those relationship is at the country level, at the regional level, at the global level, that also needs investment and different skills of staff we need to have. In the first generation of international leaders that we took, all from Brank Bangladesh, from a mid-level managers who are field managers in operations. Today, in the second generation, I'm saying, mostly people coming from other NGOs or from countries. So that's a little bit of departure and some development, but we are not yet there with our market competitors, if we want to say that. Two more challenges we have facing now, strengthening our monitoring. There are challenges in terms of building capacity, also in terms of access. How do you monitor programs in Afghanistan, where there are security challenges? So that's a challenge. How do you really do one is the real time monitoring, use of technology. We're doing in Pakistan, we're doing in, in Uganda and Tanzania, but also that security. So, how do you really bring more technology in, in your program service and also use it as a tool for monitoring the programs? And we have to be more robust in our research. We would like to do more research and, and partnership in, in bringing more evidence. So going forward, we have now embarked on a global strategy work. I'll just end in a minute saying that we've been debating, now we have Bangladesh strategy, we have Africa strategy we developed in 2017, and Africa strategy we said very clearly that we would like to do limited number of countries, mindful about our bandwidth, and uh, build partnership with local and global organizations to scale it up because we cannot scale up by ourselves. And third is the more evidence-based uh, policy advocacy. Generate more evidence and do policy advocacy based on that with you know, national governments, uh, global leaders, international organizations in terms of that. So that approach would be going. With that in mind, board debated, both board, Bangladesh board and Black International board debated, Black US board, Black UK board. So we said, okay, going forward is that we should have a global strategy now. What it means. What it means for Black to be global organization. We need to understand that ourselves and make, make it clear, so bring more clarity. With that intention, we went to the board and board approved uh, uh, to have a global strategy. We have embarked on the journey and we have finished the first phase of the work and probably the, uh, by mid or third quarter of the 2019, we will have the global strategy prepared and go to the board and get this approval from all the uh, agencies that we are working together as a family. And what it also means for Bragg University. We have university, we have Bragg Bank, does it capture the BRAC strategy? What it means for us? So that needs to be answered when we take, take the global strategy work. 
I was in Bellagio with about 20 plus colleagues from around the world on, for consultation on this uh, last week. And uh, two, three things they said to us very clearly. The remain southern, don't get out of it. In terms of governance, there are some of the organizations have changed their governance structure, like Save the Children or uh, Oxfam. And they said, study them very clearly, what they have done, are they been effective? So BRAC remain, your focus area is the, the, the delivery of critical services, women's sector program, your gender-based uh, approach, approach is very clearly uh, produce results. So remain that way and also build more partnership. And I personally believe also building partnership with the, particularly the national governments for scaling up, because that's what is sustainable at the end of the day. The way we are building partnership in Bangladesh, in education sector, in a tuberculosis. Tomorrow, our founder is speaking at the event General Assembly on Bragg's work on tuberculosis, how we worked on tuberculosis. And we have a book on tuberculosis also, with the help of Professor Richard Cash from Harvard University. So that's knowledge we want to create. I think I'll stop here. Uh, the journey is, is very exciting for us. Bragg International is, is still adolescent. We are 10 to 15 years old, uh, or teenagers, you can say. We're teenagers. Mm -hmm. Black is adult. Black is adult is about 47 years old. So how do you okay. blend these uh, 47 year old adults' learn learnings to the countries that we've been, when we think we are very much loved in the countries that we work, and to remain a southern organization, how do you build its uh, both management structure and governance structure in the future so that we remain effective and relevant for the future in the countries that we work and for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you for listening. So we're going to hear a three. Sorry, uh, I, yeah, so a short video? Yes, I'm just going to press play. Thank you. Short video on that. I was supposed to mention it. No worries. Thank you. We're a small group. Katineza alo umana na atafu na supporti yungi na so echo yungi. Sente abazade vangile zibula. Ovulambu angivari vizibu nyo. Norin na ini nasoma kona hii mpulai mali. Ne mungambo sovolo kwe yungira maso katine mungamba jango yungire mchibi na ajafi.
if you're fixing this, this, this short video is about the EOs and uh, adolescents and the whole issue that we see in the future opportunity that, that we took from Bangladesh. We could support a adolescent development program. But when we took it back international to countries like Uganda that you show this short film, mm -hmm. and from Uganda to Tanzania, like Liberia, like Syria, and beyond, now in Nepal. And that's three things I've really done. We also have done a study on this, a randomized control study. We've done and seen that it has increased uh, the, after two years, 30 seconds, it is their income by more than 40%. Their, uh, their unsafe sex behavior has gone down. And their, uh, the safe space given, that's, that's the most important thing for them. So it gives their life skills and life notes. In, in these spaces. And yesterday this event took place by the Safety Children and, and many of colleagues from their own city were attending this meeting in, in DC. And the first time I think a lot of evidence has come from the, across the world in different countries. Very strong powerful evidence has come that the way these interventions are designed for the young and adolescents to bring more right skills so that they can deploy the space and generate more employment. Because the, the world is facing this Africa, we need Africa, or even some of the Asian countries, very young population. So how do we have these nice scales? And like I said, but on the journey of mobilizing the resources to scale it up and get the right skills and life skills both together and deliver it through technical education or even apprenticeship with different models that we try in different social sectors. So this is what and this also bringing more evaluations, you know, what evaluation states says are they being effective. And the recent developments are very positive from across the countries. But this is done on the ground level. Yeah. Now, some of you may have been here, uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, when we had a seminar on some of the most recent findings on the ILA program, in which they followed up some of the girls participating. A few years later, they found that there had been some very uh, powerful, longer term um, effects. For example, they had much less um, victimization with violence than those in the control group, which was, uh, to me, a very striking and very important finding. So, uh, very interesting program. So, um, I guess that I could perhaps open this up. I had a, a couple of thoughts while you were speaking, and I, I'll just um, perhaps ask a, a couple of them. Um, so, w one has to do with, on the one hand, you have, oh, have I been wrong? Yeah, I just have to keep my, uh, you know, um, perfect record of never getting the microphone right I think, on, on error number 345 or something of that kind. So we hear um, very much about um, BRAC as being a quintessential example of successful scaling up. So we have scaling up of individual programs, we have integrated scaling up in a country, we have scaling up now going you know, internationally. And it, it's very striking. And so you know, a question is, when you reach very large scale and there are many unanticipated shocks that you experience in the developing world, how do you also maintain flexibility? Right? So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a very striking event, now I have to remember how long ago it was, I guess it was about eight years ago, in which there were some massive floods in Bangladesh. It was uh, one of the two or three worst, I think, that Bangladesh has experienced. And temporarily, the entire organization, as I understood it, paused most things that it was doing and, and was able to quickly, you know, sort of um, uh, do, a, do a turnaround, so to speak, and focus on this. I thought that was very striking. And I wonder what you might um, have to say about that in the context of scaling up and perhaps in Brec, um international experience. I think it's, it's, it's still there. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at the recent uh, shock scale, uh, in terms of one is the uh, struggle that we were born out of uh, this uh, disaster and, and man made calamities or, or natural shocks. But then slowly, what happened over the decades more, we've always been responsive to these kind of shocks, uh, including the last one, recent one going on in Rohingya, things yeah. in Bangladesh. And why we were so successful in Rohingya response, why not other matches? The reason is that we are presented. The night of the influx of people coming in last October, we are there. We had, at that time, in place 300 past staff. And we, one, 
signal. Stop all work, as you say, turn around tomorrow morning and do this, 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 this. First, start building your trench. Well, can you do it internationally? Yes. I responded in recent one is, is in Myanmar. Very strange things. In Bago region, there's a flash park. And we were the first organization. And that's what I appreciate it, because we are in, under the radar of intelligence in, in Myanmar government, because we are coming from Bangladesh. Though we are in touch they know we are coming from Bangladesh. So what's going on in, in, in Chittagong, and of course in Bizarre, and this flood has happened. So government appreciated the way we have responded in Bangladesh. Similar things we did in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and uh, in, uh, after the earthquake in uh, Tanzania. So that is in our one thing, instead of DNA. That you build it, just, you can always have the flexibility to respond to the immediate need of any kind of these things happens. Because the structure is like this, the, as I said, the ecosystem. From branch to re area, area to region, so one command goes, the field office informs this is a calamity here, and what is your decision? And they come with the advice. And the central office in the country decides on that. So I think uh, when you go there, or as a structural design, that kind of interaction happens. And the staffs are meeting almost every week and change, exchange information. So that also another way of having sharing information, which is not through monitoring report, but it's also talking. Like is largely a talking about it talks about in the system. So I think that flexibility is, is main. The one response, uh, it's a short, long answer to your short question in the sense, we are known now as a development organization, an effective one. And that's why the NGO advisors has selected us for the last few years in a row the number one organization. But do we say the same that we were so uh, development plus in the generation. So we would like to respond to both. That would mean that to build the capacity within the organization. We have started from the learnings of Rohingya response and some of the responses we have made in international countries. We are capturing all the knowledge, what it means for us, and we want to build that capacity in the organization. And we should also be the first organization of choice if there is a call coming. So that should be ready to respond uh, in terms of earthquake, or in nature, uh, 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 <coughs> challenge the country, but uh, at the same time, uh, also, how do you build the uh, rehabilitation part, slowly moving to the development part. But start immediate response to shocks. Now that is very interesting. I'm going to add to my list of scaling ups that RAC has done, scaling up flexibility and, and responsiveness. And, you know, that's, that's another interesting dimension for that. Um, so maybe I'll just ask one other question that occurred to me while you were talking, and we all talk about RAC as a famous learning organization, which you mentioned also in your talk, and we've had, you've had some years of experience, about a decade, uh, just about one decade of experience in, in Africa. Now you are moving to Rwanda, a new country, for the first time, and I was wondering uh, if you had any reflections on some of the things you've learned working in the other African countries uh, now that you're moving to a new country, um, Rwanda. So what are the lessons that you, know, you think will give you a head start, as it were, in starting in, in Rwanda? Good question. So what we didn't do much <clears throat> in terms of the, and this is the extreme poor. If you look at the, uh, the portfolio that we have in the internal countries, we haven't done much in terms of the flagship program that we call is the ultra poor graduation program, which is the bottom of the pyramid, uh, eight to ten percent, depending on which country you are talking. And there is an opportunity now to engage the national government, and that's what approach we have taken. So our RAC yourself is getting in touch with the Rwandan government, the Minister of Finance, that we have a model, and at the same time we do start the microfinance, and we would like to start both. We didn't do that in Uganda. We didn't do that in other countries. In reflection, we have started lately in the ultra poor vision program. In this year, we started in Liberia, we started in Uganda, we started in Pakistan, and also we did in Afghanistan. And some we did in, what is it, after. Here, it's a learning that we could do it together and then show that how the complementary can work and people can go gradually measure to the market uh, approach of going to the wrong level. 
Thanks for that. That second good one, I think, is the stock. That's very, very interesting. Well, great. So we have lots of um, expertise out here in development and a lot of people learning um, about development with lots of questions. So we will. You have. Um, oh, thank you. I'm wondering how you interface with other NGOs. Your technique and your approach sounds unique um, in that my impression is that other NGOs operate very much top-down from established models. Is that the case? And if so, do you have an interface with those NGOs and what happens at that interface in terms of any cooperative activity? Good question, thank you. <clears throat> Let me give an example of my uh, real life. When I was in the health department as a director in the <clears throat> early 2000s, and we started designing a program with the other NGOs. And in Bangladesh, for the education and the global fund. Two rounds of meetings, 2002-2003, failed. Couldn't form a partnership. The reason was, uh, me and my TV expert sitting together in the room for weeks, and we couldn't come to a, an agreement to approach. We couldn't come to uh, the real costings. Because they were, that's the first time I, it was a shock for me, that I had the prescribed model. Okay, well, this is the unit cost, and we have to agree on those unit costs. Which is a huge unit cost going back to the back offices. And we have no idea of how to build that part. So that's where the disagreement started with several of the NGOs. We have friendship, but we couldn't submit a joint application. It doesn't surprise me. What he did, we did went to the local NGOs. And we asked local NGOs to partner with Iraq and went to the Minister of Health. Would you like to partner with us? So Minister of Health, uh, because we were doing TB since in 1984 in the pilot point, and there are a lot of research on that. And a final document produced by WHO say that Iraq's model delivers <coughs> TB at that time was nine months regime, from 12 months to nine months, now it's six months regime. Uh, and cure the patient half the cost of government. So that's strong evidence. Government came forward. And we called the partnership with the government, the Minister of Health, cleared the <coughs> uh, division of labor, and we had the local NGOs together. So we took two thirds of the country by Brack and one third of the country other local NGOs. And the delivery is self delivery. It's not easy. And I found it in two years' time, local NGOs started complaining about us. So I was thinking, why is it coming? What is it coming from? So I asked my colleagues that what's going on here? Why am I hearing the local NGOs are complaining about that? So then, it's good that we are here, we're listening. But I went out and I <coughs> talked to my colleagues in the training department and finance department. But they are recording, recording kind of mistakes. They are, are, are black as a law, very strong internal control system. Being an accountable organization, an internal organization. So build that capacity. So the local NGOs are saying that don't treat us like we're thieves. Help us in building our own capacity. So that was the first lesson we learned from that. So we, uh, we sent out a team to all the local NGOs to what is the need and design a training program as per the need. And we had a couple of rounds of the design of the programs and deliver the programs. 2004 till today, the partnership goes on. And mm -hmm. So that's one. I think uh, uh, one is the trust and transparency. With the INGOs, there is a challenge and competition for us in terms of cost of delivery, in terms of, uh, I'm not blaming anybody. We are not able to retain uh, high quality talents. Sometimes we lose them in Bangladesh and outside to the INGOs. They are our competitors. We lose them. But uh, that's the challenge. We don't have an answer for that. I don't have an answer. But I think at uh, end of the day, if you take Afghanistan, we just completed a project in Afghanistan funded by DFID. One component was delivered by same project, Aga Khan Foundation and Save the Children Partnership and Bragg separately. The final evaluation came on the phase one. The Bragg delivered the same education project, half the cost, double the size of the beneficiary. So when it came the renewal of the contract, it came to Black Hole. 
So that's the dilemma we have. But with local organizations in, in a country, in the Philippines, we have all the programs delivered to local NGOs. Excellent relationship with the With the NGOs, we, we need to learn more how to give space to each other, how to learn from each other. I think we have a, we have a challenge here. Interesting. As you scale up, I predict more competitive reaction. But my colleagues can add if you want to. Okay. Professor Steve is making that. Okay, great. Thank you. So he's sitting there. I'm just a little bit confused. Bangladesh has gone through a rather turbulent set of years, from, actually from 46, but from, especially from 71 on. Uh, different kinds of governments and different leadership in government. Uh, at the same time, while all that was happening, the, the uh, two different NGO groups or innovative groups, you know, Brackley one and, and uh, Mohammed Yunus and his group being another, uh, but especially with, with uh, Brack. The question is, how did Brack manage to get along with the government under all of those different, and I think to a certain degree that's true today. And the second part of that could be, what kind of experiences have you had in Africa as well as the other countries, the international countries? in relationships with governments. Very good. Thank you, Thomas. <coughs> you bring your old friend of Prak also. Uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, Bangladesh, as I said, I give a lot of credit to the Bangladesh governments. Because Bangladesh government has given space, understood its own limitations of uh, not being able to deliver services, uh, neither phys with physical infrastructure nor with human infrastructure in the 70s, 80s. And later on, so get space. That's why the results are so striking results in the region, still spending much less, both in education and health, and we have better results in the human development index compared to the neighboring countries, ahead of all the countries in neighboring uh, Pakistan, India, Nepal. So, Barack has always been knowing that we are one, not competing with the world. We are only supporting our governments government stated policy. Support those to remain a political. Don't be partisan. No partisan politics. So we are in development business. We would like to do what is needed. And that's in general both the all the governments are saying that we would like to give more education to the children. We would like to give more create more jobs for the people, you know, young. We would like more girls to be in the school and education, uh, financial services, healthcare. So we, we try to listen to the community, to the people and remain a political. That's it. Is it helping this approach? Uh, time on and off sometimes, even in Bangladesh now, uh, the government, sometimes the government tried to control the civil society organizations, uh, but they have given space. Uh, we have been able to t express our views to the highest level of the government, who are the majority parties in power. In some countries, we faced uh, uh, challenges, particularly on the issue of uh, that also we faced in, in Bangladesh uh, on financial integrity. That pressure comes from us. In Afghanistan, we were very shocked, uh, personally me, because uh, my team had enormous experience of dealing with global fund on TB and malaria. We don't know, do much of the HIV AIDS, but TB and malaria, we think, is, is our niche area. We have learned over the years. We were doing this Afghanistan project as a principal decision, and we had the pressure to go for uh, informal and ratings, and she declined. And then it went to, to our utter surprise. That's why the donors uh, should debate the is uh, the where the donors were in terms of uh, honest broker. UNDP became the uh, principal decision. Why UNDP? 
what, what advantage we are giving us. Now, even if we got the leadership, because we didn't give in, and even if we now comes back to Prague, can you really work for us? In Sierra, in Sierra Leone, uh, we were pressurized by the previous government. Uh, I was there, my colleagues were there, uh, two years back, last year, even, before the election. And um, unfortunately, two ministers were uh, pressurizing us uh, in terms of our position on female genital mutilation. And she said that you cannot advocate that because you, your healthcare program, your education program, all talking about that. And she said, she kept my director waiting for five hours, didn't see her. I was there, she kept me waiting for two hours. She was a minister, she was Mr. Koroma's uh, favorite minister. Uh, and then uh, I heard later on, GFI, the country director, and UNICEF country director, both of them told me, one is the UNICEF country was asked, declared the person not grant that she should leave because of the position of female genital mutilation, because we don't, they said, it is our cultural things, why do you stop it? Our culture promotes it. And her deputy minister, completely against her. So the senior minister and deputy minister are fight. So in that environment, uh, we have to say that we have, we have what we feel professionally right, we said that. And she even pressurized that you cannot do microfinance because you work with women. You have microfinance 100% voters for women, you work with women, you have to come to my ministry. Our ministry is the women and children affairs. Right? And I told her that, Excellency, thank you very much. We do microfinance with the central bank. So central bank has the permission, given the permission, and minister finance. So that kind of pressure will come. I think uh, as long as we remain professionally clear and don't yield to any pressure in terms of uh, financial disciplines, integrity, that will be pressure, but we can live with that. solutions provided were not really suited for that country. You know, they were just top down uh, or imagined by someone had in headquarters without the local background or uh, the local institution uh, knowledge. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the factors that you think that were very um, effective or very essential for the success of BRAC uh, compared to some other organizations, such as BANK? Well, bank is World Bank. Yes. We cannot become. I mean, World Bank is a, is a lending operation, and uh, they work through the government mostly. And we work with the people, the like of the country, but of course the government, uh, listen to the government, and also the people, what the people needs. And they said we will go to a small areas, study the people's need. We try to do with a small infrastructure with microfinance platform creating a platform and create the infrastructure, the river service, and also learn from people what is their need. And we cannot do everything. We have our own limitations. So whatever the tested models we have found working, contextualize them. And our staff is the also a huge resource for us. They're all local. 98% now all local in the entire black education program. Only 2% experts. And also that's very much skewed towards Bangladesh, coming from Bangladesh, and now we're changing it. We're changing it to make it more international, from one end to another. This adolescent program that you saw, when we started this adolescent program in West Africa, there was a pressure, shall so we said, get somebody from Bangladesh? We said no, because we're doing it for a long time in Uganda and Tanzania. Get people from Uganda and Tanzania to go to West Africa. And they did excellent. But we lost some of them to UN agencies. When our staff does very well, and all the leaders, uh, Barbara, Salma Babu, I remember the names, beautiful girls, excellent leadership. They even presented at the global forums. We lost them to other agencies. I think this model loss from another point of view. It's a huge uh, brain circulation. These people remain uh, at the brain, right? 
But I think our main success story coming was we work with the people, change at the demand of the people. If it doesn't work, we change it. We dismantle it and do something else. And uh, there are instances of failures also that uh, we, we listen to. It. And we cannot compare ourselves with World Bank because World Bank is <coughs> lending mostly to government. We work with the government projects if they want to come to the government. Like we, there is a government project in Uganda has a huge problem in terms of the, the contractors uh, on the road project. And the government have asked us to address the issue because we, were, we, we are more accepted in the community. Because this is all the, the child level and sexual abuse all done by the contracting agencies under the World Bank Road Project. So now we are seen as an ally for the Ministry of well, uh, Roads and Highways in Uganda. So that's how we, 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 we build our reputation through our own work. And that, as I said, our own staff give us the highest level of criticism. Black is certainly the best criticism of us this own work. So that space, we, we allow that space to talk and, and talk to each other and give the feedback. I'm not sure whether I answered your uh, question that I can try it. We have time for one more question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the social enterprise <coughs> part of BRAC has managed to actually generate revenue and be profitable, which is not always the case with those types of uh, ventures. Can you talk about why you were able to achieve that and if it was replicable in the model of BRAC internationally in other countries? Good question. I think the answer is yes in the long run. It's not that if you look at the deeper into the, each of the enterprises that Brack has built in Bangladesh, each of them came from the dire need of the helping the poor people. I'll give an example of, of day. When Brack was giving micro loans and all, people were thinking all the time, these cows were giving so little milk. And when I was a young boy, I used to say that my grandma had cows and they were giving half a liter. Maximum one liter a day, two times if you perform milking that. So how do you pay the loans to the cow? Because most people are investing in cows. So Brett and founder and his team are thinking, how do you really increase the productivity here? So increase the productivity, a lot of research is going to. And we didn't make it possible. So we reached out to government livestock department and found someone who understood the magic and said, would you like to come? He said, no, I'm not designed. Civil services, how should I design? Okay, would you like to work with us? Yes. So I gave technical assistance. How do you do the artificial insemination? So we were the first one to establish the artificial insemination in Bangladesh. And that itself is a social enterprise. Hundreds of them men are trained in artificial insemination and they were on cell phone and motorbikes. You get a call and they go and give a shot and get the money. So that itself is an enterprise. So we, we, they're not anybody's their own. They have their own life started. Second, when this program started, we were getting first a high grade uh, cows, and then the food is a challenge for a small country that we were professionally that explained the country among us. Very small uh, piece of land that we have 160 million people. So, for research, it has come down to a size of 8 to 10 liters. This is drill. If I look back 20, 30 years back, these cows were absolutely insane. These cows were not there. Now, if you go any village, then you will find this cause of Then this making started. And these people were giving you so a price. And in cities, you don't get this milk. So blacks started thinking, oh, why do you mean? These milks are now being not market. So blacks started setting up chilling system. We don't want to because we want this. The women who are having this cause to be benefited. So blacks started chilling stations, collecting all the milks engaged uh, the uh, marketing people, marketing officers, and then we can get daily. Now, several products. That's a social enterprise. Can they be done in other countries? We are trying. We have started one with uh, two in uh, West Africa, one with uh, <coughs> poultry and hatching. Uh, that is all backyard chicken. So how do you modernize this chicken? That was the first pioneer in Bangladesh in doing the poultry, modern poultry, including feed milk. We had 100% market share on that. Our training center, who we know in Sabah, the first course, it was our poultry food. Now it's the university. Now today, the others have come in. Private sector is coming. Our market share is less than 7% today. So we have 
incentivize others at the same possibilities. So we are now in one Liberia uh, on the policy equipment. We hope that we will be able to make it sustainable. What is the government in terms of the tax regime so that the people are not dumping their, Brazilians are not dumping their poultry there. So how is the market for this? One is uh, Uganda where you don't see uh, high and variety seeds for vegetables and maize. So they're doing that also. And also sweet potatoes, which is a World Bank Finance project through so Japan Grand Fund. They're doing it in, in Uganda. So we think it's possible. It takes time. No All right. On that very interesting note, um, okay, do we have, we'll take one, one last question. And then, uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, go back to this uh, question of the middle-aged uh, person versus the teenager. And in particular, I was thinking, um, do you have any examples of areas of work in Bangladesh that were successful enough um, that you were able to transition them to the public sector that either could be given back to the realm of the government or that could be transitioned purely into the private sector, separate from BRAC's activities? And what lessons does that um, to show you for what your scope of work might look like in uh, for BRAC International? When you go into a country like Rwanda, do you have an idea that 20 years from now you might be able to pass on some of the activities that you're, you're undertaking to the central government or to purely local um, private, private sector actors? Um, and if yes, what, what are the sigma markers or the outcomes that show you that the country, the national government, is ready to be doing this work all by itself or that the private sector is ready to move into that area? If you, good question. <coughs> the, the pre prime it was not in the concept in our life in Bangladesh. There's no pre prime Start with BRAC, very well. So BRAC has been discussing this issue for a long time, and we started the pre prime model. Okay, so we're there. There's an education expert. I'm talking in front of the legendary figure here. So pre primary was model started by many organizations, including BRAC. And there's been very successfully transferred to a government now. All primary schools in the government of Bangladesh has ordered that we should have a pre So it's successfully transferred. That's one example. Uh, in health sector, many of the examples were there, which have been taken over by the government and running by the government under conversation many conversations, including uh, starting with immunization. Immunization was 2%, and in the 80s, it was a high fertility, high mortality country. Family planning is all driven by private sector organizations. And then slowly, the government came to leadership role, took it over, and then uh, BRAC was organizing the immunization centers bringing women and children to the centers, giving all the credit to the government, the Ghani giving the shots. At that time, the president said that I don't have the capacity to maintain the cold chain. What Brad did, I was surprised, and I was already Brad, and I discovered it was such a great innovation. How do you try to take the vaccines, virus, to the rural areas? And the president said that let's establish the rural electricity health fast, refrigerator health fast, and some district level, then we'll let them manage would be 2% of the United James Blair was the UNICEF chief at that time. Uh, <clears throat> then we started innovating and discussing, and finally, for a military government, the innovative approach started. The virus were taken, the vaccines were taken inside the banana. Inside the live banana, put the vaccine at the mains, potential remains from the nearest cold chain, they take it to the village. That's the definition of pain. Now, we have the more than 90% of the United and the high mortality has gone down. 30 days gone down from 72 in one generation. No other country has shown that, you know, that kind of poverty and that kind of conservative, male dominant, Muslim driven society. What is the lesson for other countries? I think uh, how, do you, how do we prove ourselves that we are the organization of choice despite our 98% staff from local communities, from villages, townships? And national product. But uh, I think we have to invest more in terms of uh, building staff capacity. That has always been great in investing in staff capacity. A lot of investment in, in staff capacity, in, in training staff in different disciplines. And also engaging with the government in terms of uh, 
uh, handing over, working together. It's the question of how do you do the nimble things, uh, embedding uh, in the public sector. A lot of private organizations, like as I gave the poetry, when Brock was doing the poetry in the 70s and 80s, no one was doing poetry, no one poetry. Now all the other are the private sector, huge private sector. If you go to the village, in our childhood, chicken will come on the table if there are guests. No guests, no chicken. If today, poor people are getting chicken on the table at least once or twice a week, and the private sector is taking it up. So, can that be done in other cities? I think it can be done. It has to be tested strategic. We don't know. The approach will be to uh, do the nimble things in terms of, I don't want to say the word hand holding, but being inside that and doing things with that, with the government and with the private sector together, and we learn from each other slowly, the government will be happy to take it over from the United States. But that would be in needing different skills in terms of how do you really uh, work with the government. There are some people who have told me that uh, sometimes the NGO said that the government is a bunch of idiots. Uh, that's how the attitude is also a uh, half attitude, wrong attitude, because we have to give them the due respect in space and mutual learning. I think that has done members a good favor when the nimbleness and, and the embedding in different public sector interventions uh, were done by different organizations. USAID and World Bank did an excellent job in the 70s in uh, working with the government in, in the firm printing sector. Despite a lot of challenges, I think both of the government. People can ask a million dollar question, was it right to serve the health ministry? You just paid a dividend. But was it right uh, to have a separate health ministry, family cleaning ministry? It needs to be investigated further. Uh, Haryana Swana of, of, of Indonesia, at that time he was the Deepak Venture, not the health minister. When Michai of Thailand advised against, but we created a separate ministry because of focus intervention, government driven. Immunization was the driver seat by the government. But started by the NGOs, brand, hair, the donors started the emotion. But then the diversity. Working together and would need different kind of uh, skin, thick skin, and rubbing with the shoulder in terms of giving that space. I think that helps a lot. And doing research more importantly, in operation research, uh, that what we are learning, what and, and every time feeding back the research to the programs. And tweaking it and giving feedback, both on, in terms of programmatic intervention, also the systems, on the system side. So those kind of research is very critical. From the design, not research should not be at the end of the uh, project design. Research should be upfront at the beginning. All right. So let's uh, formally wrap it up here and thank you. And I'm sure that we could have a little bit of a conversation afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much.